I thank the ambassador from United Kingdom um, for her intervention. I give the floor now um, to the ambassador representative of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. Gracias, señor presidente. Thank you, President. To begin, I think it is incumbent upon us to respond to a broad range of lies and false information that we heard from the mouth of the Vice President of the United States here. We're supposed to be here discussing the humanitarian situation, but I think we need to respond to what he said so we can clarify things before the international community, before the people of Venezuela, before the media. He lied in saying that yesterday the region as a whole rejected the representative of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela and the Organization of American States. That is false. That is a lie. It is misinformation, a problem that perhaps he needs to address with his legal team. Yesterday, what happened in their thirst to promote a coup d'etat in Venezuela and impose a puppet government to uphold their interest, the U.S. interest in Venezuela, which would allow for the pillaging of our resources, then they ran roughshod over the founding charter of the OAS, which is commensurate with the Charter of the United Nations. And they twisted the law to such an extent that what was approved was not the expulsion of the representative of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela to the OAS. Rather, they approved and adopted the inclusion of a representative of the National Assembly of Venezuela. And this is absurd. It's a legal fiction, what happened yesterday. Because the OAS, just like the United Nations, is an organization of states. It is not an organization bringing together national assemblies. And the only state present representing us in this organization is the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. Thus, the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela was not expelled from the OAS. What we have instead in the OAS is a strange individual. Nobody understands what he's doing there, what he will be doing there, because he doesn't represent the state of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. He represents the National Assembly. It's important to understand that. That's so what was said was a lie. Why do I flag this here? Because this is just part of the machinery of lies which is intended to sell the course of action of the United States to the members of the United Nations. What they're seeking to do is impose a public government and they want to convince the United Nations of the rightness of their actions. They want to see the United Nations as the club of friends, the backyard of the United States. They have to subordinate the United Nations to their interest, to the Monroe Doctrine. The Monroe Doctrine being a racist policy that was set up 200 years ago by a slaving state and which runs roughshod over international law. It has no basis in international law. There's no basis in international law for what the United States is doing. And um, we are sure when the United States attempted to pull the wool over the eyes of the uh, attempts here in the United Nations to play the same trick as it played in the Organization of American States, pulling the wool over the eyes of those present, it will fail here. We certainly hope it will fail here. It is threatened with war. It has threatened us with war as well. All options are on the table. On what legal basis are all options on the table? On what legal basis can one country threaten another with war here around this room? This is something else the United Nations should address. Now turning to the topic that brings us together here, President. The si humanitarian situation in Venezuela does need to be resolved. But if we err in the diagnosis, then we will also be mistaken in the treatment that we give that's intended to bring succor to Venezuela. The situation, as has been said here, is the fruit of human action. But what everyone has tiptoed around here in the room, including the three briefers who are very smart, intelligent people, they're able to draw together data, analyze that data, including Mr. Stein, who's a very wise man, but they shut their eyes to what the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela wants to share with them. But they will hear, for example, the dictator government in, in Guatemala. That has been done by Mr. Stein and his team. But yet they refuse to meet with us to hear what we have to say. But as I was saying, none of the three briefers and none of the members of the Security Council acknowledge the elephant in the room, which is that the actions that have led to the humanitarian suffering that we're seeing in Venezuela are the direct fruit of a plan of economic destruction uh, put together by the government of the United States and the United Kingdom with the goal of strangling our national economy, thus triggering the maximum degree of social suffering, eroding the capacity of our nation 
for self-sufficiency and to respond to said suffering. And when all is said and done, the intention here is to provoke a social implosion, implosion that they can then use as a pretext for foreign military intervention hiding behind the perverse notion of the responsibility to protect that has been the pretext wielded for colonial invasions of those countries that have oil reserves. This is a mind-boggling, inhumane experiment in unconventional warfare. It's a policy of calculated cruelty, violating en masse human rights. Going so far, I would say, as to being equivalent to committing crimes against humanity. And all of this is done with the goal of justifying the pillaging and looting to justify the imposing of a subordinate and puppet local government, and in our particular case, the hiding behind a racist ideology, the Monroe Doctrine. People might think that we're exaggerating, but you only need to hear the words themselves of these criminals. This is not what I had to say. This is what has been said by these criminals by the United States. On the 9th of January 2018, spokespersons of the Department of State affirmed that the campaign of pressure targeting Venezuela is working. And what we are seeing is a complete economic collapse in Venezuela. In other words, our policy is working, our strategy is working, and we will stay the course with this policy and with this strategy, end of quote. In October of last year, Ambassador William Brownfield of the United States said, and here I quote directly, we need to treat this as a, a, a suffering, tragedy, agony that will continue until it reaches its end point. And if we can do anything to speed up this process of tragedy and agony, then we should do it, understanding that this will have an impact on millions of people who are already having difficulties daily in finding food and medicine. We cannot pursue this course of action and pretend that it will have no impact whatsoever. We have to take a hard and harsh decision. The end justifies the means of this severe punishment. These are not diplomatic words. These are not the words of a humanitarian agent. This is inhumane. This is cruel. These are the words justifying an international crime, a determination and a willingness to punish the entire Venezuelan people. Senator Marco Rubio, who supported the coup d'etat in Venezuela, stated that over the next few weeks, Venezuela will go through a period of suffering that no other country in the Western Hemisphere has ever suffered in modern history. And on the 22nd of March 2019, John Bolton, of infamous memory and ignominy in this organization, said that this is like Star Wars. This is similar to when Darth Vader strangled someone, snuffed their life out. This is what we're doing economically to Venezuela. I'm not inventing any of this. You can go back and check. These are their words. This is deliberate economic destruction. It's the systematic application of the policy of aggression with the use of financial instruments wielded against us and undue pressure. They have used their dominant position in the markets to influence the banking sector, private businesses and other nations that engage in legal business and exchange and trade with Venezuela, including agencies of the United Nations who have also suffered extortion wielded by the United States. And all of this is to isolate our country from the trade systems and international financial systems of this planet. If it was true that the Venezuelan government, as has been affirmed here so many times as part of a litany of lies, if it was true that the Venezuelan government, as has been claimed erroneously, is killing its own people, then why is this group of countries doing all it can on such a mass scale to increase the suffering? Why would there be the need if we're already responsible for the suffering of our people? This gives the truth to the lie. It is them who are responsible for the suffering of our people. It is them who are seeking social breakdown to justify their invasion. It is a plan in which banks, insurance companies, and indeed the tools of trade such as boats and shipping systems are used with a destructive capacity comparable to weapons of mass destruction, but without those responsible for this suffering being, held, being taken before the courts to suffer moral, the moral sanction that they deserve. John Bolton said in January of this year, my advice to bankers, businessmen and other uh, traders is not to trade in gold, oil or other Venezuelan publics. Uh, on the Venezuelan products. Whilst on the 29th of March 2019, Elliot Abraham said, we're imposing our sanctions 
This is what he said directly. We, the United States, are imposing our sanctions. And what is the regime doing in response? The regime is trying to find ways to sidestep said sanctions, to seek out new clients, clients to seek new markets for imports. So what do we do in response? We observe very closely and we can see boats on the ocean moving and we can see contracts being signed with new companies and the minute we detect such action we speak with the shipping companies with the transport companies with the refineries with the governments and we sell them you should not we tell them you should not be doing this this is what we are doing that's what mr abrahams was saying he who was depicted here as an angel an agent of humanity and humanitarian action this reprehensible act is a criminal policy of mass destruction and it goes hand in hand with the looting and pillaging that has cost our nation so many millions of dollars at the same time as they're depriving our people of essential goods leading to huge levels of suffering they are with this with the left hand robbing our Venezuelan people of thousands of millions if not billions of dollars the profits of our refineries are being used to pay the debts of oil companies that are friendly to the government of Trump. His friends hold Venezuelan debt and they're receiving special licenses to pursue profits with money stolen from our people. That's what they're lining their pockets with. That's what they're profiteering from. They have announced a plan to lead into debt my country which has led to a debt of $70 billion. And this money is used to pay uncertified debts that are allegedly the fruit of shadowy financial negotiation, but nobody can prove the amount of these debts which this money is allegedly being used to pay off. We cannot forget the fact that the Bank of England, which robbed our people of $1.2 billion in gold with the excuse that they did not recognize the president of Nicolas Maduro and they, and they will continue the sanctions of Trump. And then we hear the representative of the United Kingdom talking about the fact that they took this step to avoid money laundering which is just ridiculous that gold has been in the bank of england for 30 years now with nobody raising concerns about money laundering whatsoever they are working together with the puppet government and saying that they are complying with the sanctions of the united states and with the order of the british government to recognize the puppet government the credibility of the bank of england as a neutral and uh, impartial organization has been ruined their reputation is as naught all they're doing is supporting the government of trump the colonialist policies of trump are building on their own colonialist history and their own history of piracy which they pursued for at least the last 200 years this is the real cause of the plight of Venezuelan people. There is no other reason for it. Our people are suffering, and our government too, as can be testified to by the Secretary General, who's working closely and hard with the United Nations system to boost the number of cooperation projects, as well as the volume and capacity of these programs, particularly in the healthcare sector, as well as the sectors of food, education, electricity, and transport. There can be no doubt, President, if you were better informed in Venezuela, you would know that vaccines are available in Venezuela and our coverage of vaccinations for malaria and measles, for example, and to be able to stamp out these diseases has improved markedly, markedly thanks to our partnership with organizations such as the World Health Organization. People are being deceived that vaccines are available in Venezuela and our healthcare coverage, including the delivery of vaccines, has improved remarkably over the last few years. All of that is measurable. The same is happening with our cooperation with the ICRC, the president of whom met yesterday in Caracas with our head of state, Nicolas Maduro, to make progress in the founding of a direct mechanism that would uh, facilitate genuinely neutral, impartial and independent assistance. And the same can be said of friendly countries who stand ready to provide assistance on a peaceful basis and fully respecting our sovereignty in so doing. One key factor that has been underestimated by those who are waging war against Venezuela is the sheer strength of our national spirit, which only increases when we are faced with difficulties. This macabre experiment in destruction and bringing to its knees and nations is 
is seeking to prove that economic crimes do work for these nefarious ends, that people will eventually break and that they will cede to the oppressive foreign power. Nonetheless, in Venezuela, they have miscalculated. The collective suffering caused is resisted by growing levels of organization and determination in our people. Our Bolivarian National Armed Forces have not broken and are more united than ever. Our workers are reacting to the attacks on our infrastructure with a discipline that the aggressors are unfamiliar with and cannot boast of for themselves. There are problems that we have to deal with, but they are not uh, there, there are problems, there are perhaps levels of, there are some instances of aggression and violence, but they are not aimed at civil war, and this will not be the end game for all that those who are bringing this pressure to bear on us would like it to be the case. Our people is setting an example to the world of how to resist in peace. It might be logical to think that the efforts of our government to overcome the difficulties caused by this aggression would in fact be recognized, applauded and supported by the international to be so interested in alleviating suffering. Rather, what we're seeing is a fresh wave of economic extortion, which is cutting off financial flows to our country and from our country to abroad, and is also affecting our cooperation with the very agencies of the United Nations, who, as I speak, are un unable to find a way to receive funding and money and to send the necessary goods and supplies to meet the needs of our people. And do you know why that is the case? It is because the government of Trump is engaged in a campaign of terror against commercial and financial agents who have anything to do with Venezuelan money. We are not asking for handouts or for anybody's money. We have our own money. But the government of Trump terrorizes economic actors, traders, and international agencies so that they won't actually touch the money that we're willing to offer to pay for the services they can provide. What the United States is interested in, and has been interested in thus far, is not humanitarian aid, but rather a covert operation without the consent of Venezuela, violating our territorial integrity with a constant threat of the use of force, as we heard again today, and openly inciting a military uprising and civil war. That's the speciality of this government of Mr. Abrahams. President, this Security Council bears the responsibility, according to Articles 24, 34, and 39 of the Charter, a responsibility to maintain and uphold international peace and security, and to identify the existence of threats to peace, and also to identify and respond to acts of aggression. And thus, we would solicit, we would demand that we request that you identify and determine the following. Firstly, what is the legal basis allowing the United States and the United Kingdom to apply to Venezuela a program of economic destruction without the express consent of this Security Council? They're enacting measures covered in Article 41 of the Charter, including an economic blockade, without the authorization and consent of the Security Council. When the Security Council reached that finding, of, uh, reached that, finding that these two nations, the United States and the United Kingdom, are acting without the consent of the Security Council and without the covering of the Charter. My second question to you, what legal authority does the United States have to sanction uh, to imply secondary sanctions to countries that trade legally with Venezuela. Thirdly, the Security Council needs to determine what is the legal basis allowing the United States to threaten Venezuela with the use of military force. Where is this legal basis to be found? Why has there been no statement made in response to what is clearly being done by the United States, such clear threats? Fourth, I would ask the Security Council to determine what is the legal authority allowing the United States and the United Kingdom to appropriate our wealth? We're supposed to thank them for their offer of $9 million to uh, address the humanitarian situation in Venezuela when the Bank of England stole $1.2 billion of our money. The Bank of England is supposed to be an independent organization. We hear from the Bank of England themselves that we are obeying the government of the United Kingdom, despite their alleged independent status. As I was saying, my fourth question to you, that you as the Security Council need to determine, what is the legal authority used by the United States and the United Kingdom to appropriate our wealth, obtaining profit therefrom with a mass violation of the human rights of our people? Fifth, the, what is the legal basis allowing the United States to intervene in affairs that are strictly the preserve of the uh, in, uh, internal preserve of the Venezuelan people and Venezuelan government in a flagrant violation of Article 2.7 of the Charter. To conclude, the diagnosis of the current situation, President, is that it is clearly and blatantly the result of a campaign of aggression meted out by 
the United States and the United Kingdom. The treatment for this suffering cannot be a fresh dose of aggressive intervention hiding behind a humanitarian facade. The solution is not in donations from criminals who want to present themselves or set themselves up as saviors. The treatment for Venezuela is not in humanitarian channels designed to provoke and trigger armed conflict or in donor conferences that hide what's actually going on. The of the resources of our nation. The treatment, rather, is, lies in returning the money which has been stolen to Venezuela, in lifting the commercial and financial blockade on our people, in ceasing the sabotage of our infrastructure and clandestine operations in ceasing the threats of military intervention and in ceasing to threaten those Venezuelans who want to engage in dialogue. We must stop this war of Donald Trump and this Security Council must live up to its responsibility and live up to its mandate, guaranteeing that Venezuela can enjoy its right to peace. Thank you very much, President. I thank the representative of um, the Bolivar Republic for his statement. Uh, the representative of the United Kingdom has asked for the floor to make a further statement. Um, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I apologize uh, for taking the floor again, but I can't allow those allegations against the Bank of England uh, to go unaddressed. Um, I reject completely uh, the allegations made uh, by the Venezuelan uh, minister. Uh, he's made them before. I wrote to the then president of the Security Council uh, the Equatorial Guinea PR on the 21st of February, uh, rejecting the allegations. I will have that letter circulated uh, again, and we'll put it on our website. Uh, but for the benefit of the record, Bank of England's reputation is world-renowned. It operates to the highest standards. It has operational independence from the British government. Thank you. I thank the representative of uh, um, UK for her statement and um, the representative of Peru has asked for the floor to make a further statement, um, Gustavo. Thank you very much, President. I promise I'll be succinct. I do not think it, it is worth responding to someone who does not represent a country duly. It is not it is beneath our dignity to respond to an, the representative of an illegitimate government. I think what we want to underscore is a point that has been referred to by many people, and that is the plight of Venezuelan refugees and migrants, which was not dealt with in the statement we just heard, and which is very important and very serious. Many countries in the, in the region are making Herculean efforts. Peru is home to some 750,000 migrants who we're supporting with our own resources. A little more than a month ago, I flagged this point to the representative of Mr. Maduro, and he wasn't able to respond to me. And so I'd like to ask him today, why didn't he refer to the serious plight of the hundreds of thousands of Venezuelans that they're suffering today? Today, we heard, to our great surprise, the frivolous way in which the representative of Mr. Maduro said that the situation in Venezuela was normal. Um, that certainly this reflects what we heard about a month ago when we addressed this in the Security Council again. We were told that everyone was happy, everyone was preparing for carnival, etc. Today what we heard additionally is that the situation is the result of sanctions and outside action. As I said in my statement, the serious humanitarian economic crisis that we're seeing in Venezuela is the direct result of domestic action. For years in Peru and in other nations, we have been seeing growing flows, growing outpourings from Venezuela of people. That's been the case for years. So we cannot accept this theory, which is intended to deceive world public opinion as to the roots of a crisis. The roots of this crisis are to be found in Venezuela itself. They are not the result of foreign meddling. Thank you very much, President. Thank the representative of Peru for his statement. The representative of uh, Venezuela has asked for the floor to make a further statement. Thank you, President. First and foremost, on the Bank of England, we will circulate to all the members of the United Nations and to the public at large the truth on this situation. The Bank of England is not independent. 
and letters of correspondence confirm that. Letters sent to our representatives in which they say black on white that they are following the sanctions applied by the government of the United States. This proves that the Bank of England is not independent. Also proof of its lack of independence is its willingness to communicate with opponents of the government of Venezuela imposed by the United States. It engages in communication with those representatives. The Bank of England has no prestige Given the, what it's doing with us, it also did with Libya in the past. The Bank of England simply seizes any opportunity available to it when a country is weak, and it swings in the wind. The most recent example is that the government of the United Kingdom states that their traditional policy is to recognize states and not governments, and that this will not change. In the case of Venezuela, they did change that policy, and now they say they don't recognize our state, but they recognize a puppet government, which doesn't control even a single street in Venezuela. And the Bank of England has swung into line behind this policy. And the president of the Central Bank of Venezuela, whom, I, whom they've dealt with for years, they they now say that they don't re recognize him because the government of the United Kingdom has changed its opinion. This is not an independent bank. We need to tread carefully if you believe that that is the case because you're entering into dangerous waters. In response to the ambassador of Peru, I think it's worth recalling to him that the United Nations is not the, cl is not the book club of the United States on the Peru and that Peru's individual decision to recognize uh, a nation or not to recognize a government or not has no impact on my status here in the United Nations. My legitimacy depends on the legitimacy of my government as recognized by the United Nations. It is not dependent on declarations by the Ambassador of Peru or the Vice President of the United States. To feel that you have the power in your hands to expel from the United Nations your friends, uh, your enemies rather, those that you don't like, simply indicates to me that you don't understand the charter of the United Nations and the purposes and principles of the United Nations. So I sound a warning bell once again that there is a clear move here again to undermine our rights. And if they can undermine our rights, they can undermine the rights of all members of this organization. So we must tread carefully and reject this. On migrants and refugees, we cannot deny that this is happening in Venezuela, but the root cause of this is economic. But I do think it's ridiculous that we use the word refugees because when you talk about refugees, you usually mean somebody who is suffering from political pressure or political persecution has to flee a country for that reason and is unable to come back. That is not the case with Venezuela. People leave Venezuela and people come back to Venezuela freely. And this happens day after day. There are instances of people going abroad for a number up to 30,000 to work abroad, but they come back the same evening. So they're not refugees. They're simply working abroad. The ambassador of Peru is suggesting that we treat as a security problem economic refugees or economic migrants. If that is the case, then he has to explain the situation of what is happening with the economic refugees on the border of the United States that are being treated as a humanitarian, as a humanitarian crisis, as a security crisis by the, president, by the government of President Donald Trump by building a wall, by sending the army to the border with Mexico. This should have been addressed by the ambassador of Peru if he really felt that migrants and refugees should be treated with the dignity that he claims that they should be. But this is not being said by the ambassador of Peru, which I think is further proof that Venezuela is being treated as a unique case and the ground is being laid for an invasion. That is why I come back to my own statement. I call upon you to exercise your duty of indicating and determining whether there is a legal basis for the action being taken against Venezuela and Venezuela alone. Thank you very much, President. I thank the representative of Venezuela for his statement. Um, as 